Hello everyone, welcome to the February edition of Let's Talk Criterion. And I have to say, I come to you with disappointing news here. The train spotting release, which came out on Tuesday the 30th of January, it's not the conventional digipack, there seems to be this flap that folds in at the back of the package, and many collectors have damaged and torn their outer case when they try to open it. The cardboard is lower grade than the normal cardboard used by Criterion, or certainly appears to be at first glance, and it can't be opened very easily without somehow tearing it. I will be waiting for my copy to arrive. Unfortunately, I do actually import discs from the US because I live in the UK, so I can't show you it on screen now, but there are some images which I'll show you of people that have clearly torn their outer packaging as they tried to open it. Also, can I just mention that inside there are pockets for the discs. They did this last year with Pasolini 101. It means you have your fingers all over the disc trying to remove it from the pocket. Again, there's no need for this packaging. Continuing the upgrade of existing releases in the Criterion Collection, we have Robert Altman with his 1971 anti-Western McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Now, of course, Robert Altman is quite popular already in the collection. He's got seven current titles, Secret Honor, Tanner Idiot, Three Women, Nashville, now out of print, Shortcuts, Out of the Player, and of course, this title. Now, the two for me that are rather missing in the collection, conspicuously, I would say, are MASH and The Long Goodbye. But perhaps we'll see MASH take its place in the collection in time. I would certainly like to see that. We live in hope. So what about McCabe and Mrs. Miller then? Well, it stars Warren Beatty and Julie Christie. Now, Julie Christie was a very bankable Hollywood actress at the time, with successes like Far From the Madding Crowd, Fahrenheit 451, and The Go-Between behind her. And Warren Beatty was still riding high from his success a few years earlier with Bonnie and Clyde, where he had received a nomination for Best Actor. And this was his 10th film. Robert Altman certainly made the right decision to put these two actors on screen together as the chemistry between them was unmistakable, but with their characters not as a romantic couple on screen, but as a business partnership. A man rides into town through the rain and he walks into a saloon, makes sure he knows where the back door is, goes to his horse, comes in with a cloth and covers a table. And the men are already pulling up the chairs before he's even settled down. He's a gambler and he's called McCabe. That's Warren Beatty. Now somebody thinks they heard that McCabe once shot a man. And in the background, somebody's vaguely heard asking, Laura, what's for dinner? <laughs> the town of Presbyterian Church is almost all male. And most of the men in the town are involved in building the actual town. It looks like a construction site. Holes are half dug. Lumbers piled up waiting to be used, and an old painted door is joined to a raw new frame. Now, apart from work, there is very little to do in the town but drink, gamble, and hire the pleasures of women. Now, McCabe takes his winnings and purchases three fancy women. Not as entertainment, though, but as an investment. Mrs. Miller, that's Julie Christie, arrives in the town, and she wants to become his partner. She is a London Cockney who has long since ceased to be interested in her own beauty, except for what it will earn her. She explains to McCabe that he knows nothing of women. He cannot see through their excuses, he cannot quiet their fears, or even see them through female troubles, so he, he doesn't even know enough to keep the whole time from catching clap within a week. Now, she will import some classier women from San Francisco, and they will do better than he can do on his own. He has to agree, we get to know them in half-seen, half-heard moments, and there is a time when he gets into bed with her. And we realise with a start that the movie has not established that they're sleeping with one another. Later, it doubles back to reveal that she's charged him, just like all the other men, and she gets $5, top price. Hence my previous comment that they are a business partnership rather than a romantic one. Still, for a movie that puts the opening of a brothel at the centre of its narrative, McCabe and Mrs Miller remains thoroughly chaste in its depiction of sexual activity. Everything is merely implied. For instance, left to the viewer's imagination. 
and fairly little is actually shown on screen, which renders Altman's film not only tasteful, but also shows us where its focus truly lies, and that is on the business dynamic between the gambler and the prostitute. Now all of this unfolds mostly indoors, in darkened rooms lit by lanterns and log fires. Episodes are punctuated by Leonard Cohen's songs, sad frontier laments. The cinematographer Vilmos Sigmund embraces the freedom of the widescreen Panavision camera. He drowns the characters in nature. It is dark, it is wet, and it is cold. And then, on top of it all, it snows. These are simple people. There's a moment, for instance, when two couples are dancing to a music box in the whorehouse parlour, and it comes to the end of a tune, and all four cluster around the box, bending low, peering at its mechanism, poised in suspense. And the next tune begins, and they spring up, relieved, to dance again. Now, in 1968, producer David Foster optioned a pulp western entitled McCabe, written in 1959 by the author Edmund Norton. But Foster was actually not looking to buy this novel. His primary goal, in fact, was meeting with the French feminist writer Simone de Beauvoir, so as to get the movie rights to the mandarins. Now, although many others had tried, it was actually Foster who sealed the deal, despite never having made a single film before. On his way out of Paris, where the meeting took place, the novelist's agent, that's Ellen Wright, gave Foster Norton's McCabe, which she also represented, and allegedly told the producer that John Huston and Roman Polanski were interested in it, a notion which prompted him to immediately read the book on the plane on the way home. Now, having landed, Foster had his attorney close the deal in regards to both de Beauvoir and Norton's novels. And soon afterwards, screenwriter and documentarian Ben Maddow got the job of adapting Norton's fiction into a script. Now, McCabe and Mrs. Miller was filmed in Squamish and West Vancouver in Canada, almost in sequential order. As the gambler McCabe was reimagining the town of Presbyterian Church by the building of a high quality brothel, the film's set was built on location to follow suit. When the only scenes left to be shot were the ones near the end, the church catching fire and McCabe's showdown with the hired assassins, it began to snow. Now, BT opposed shooting since, in his mind, they would have to film the rest of the movie in such weather for continuity's sake. But Oldman argued that the two were the only scenes they had yet to film, and with nothing better to do, he wanted to give it a shot. Now, the cat and mouse scene between McCabe and the people trying to execute him, as well as the church scene, were filmed over the course of nine days. Now, the snow we actually see in the movie was real snow, apart from a few fake chunks on the ground. And it's said that the crew members seized the opportunity to have some fun, so they engaged in snowball fights and built snowmen in between the takes. There were two other aspects of Altman's anti-Western that contributed to its status. The first one is the cinematography, done by Hungarian-born Vilmos Zygmunt. He would later become known for his camera work on movies such as Deliverance, the Deer Hunter and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Altman wanted the movie to look like antique photography and faded out pictures, which the cinematographer managed to achieve. He did this by flashing the film negative before its exposure, as well as by using numerous filters on the camera itself, so that these elements didn't have to be added in post-production. This technique broke new ground and gave the movie its surreal and distinctive quality. Now, the second aspect that emphasised the atmosphere of McCabe and Mrs. Miller was the choice of music in the film. Now, there were only three songs featured, and they were The Stranger Song, Sisters of Mercy, and Winter Lady, and they were all composed by Leonard Cohen. He had released his first album in 1967, and was still relatively unknown at that time. The story goes that the composer got a phone call from Altman right after having returned from the movies. The director told him about his work and mentioned Brewster McLeod, a small movie that nobody saw. And that turned out to be the very same film Cohen had just come back from. Now, after having provided the songs for McCabe and Mrs. Miller, Cohen watched the picture so as to think of a guitar riff for one of the scenes and didn't like what he saw. He would later, of course, re-watch it, and then call Altman to apologise for his previous harsh judgement, claiming to have loved it the second time around. 
Now, even though McCabe and Mrs. Miller was a box office flop, the critics adored it. It would be proclaimed the eighth greatest Western of all time in 2008 and chosen for preservation in the United States National Film Registry because of it being culturally, historically or aesthetically significant. And proof, if any, was needed to begin with, of course, that McCabe and Mrs. Miller achieved what only few movies do and managed to age like fine wine. Now, the film gets an upgrade to 4K UHD in the Criterion Collection from its existing Blu-ray, and the Blu-ray contains the same original supplemental features which the original release had. 4K digital restoration with uncompressed mono soundtrack and these features. An audio commentary from 2002 featuring the director Robert Altman and the producer David Foster. Making of documentary featuring members of the cast and the crew. Conversation about the film itself and Altman's career between film historians. Featurette from the film's 1970 production. Art Directors Guild Film Society Q&A from 1999 with production designer Leon Erickson. Excerpts from archival interviews with cinematographer Vilmos Zygmunt. A gallery of stills from the set by photographer Steve Shapiro. Excerpts from the 1971 Dick Cavett Show, featuring Altman and film critic Pauline Kael. A trailer and an essay written by the novelist and critic Nathaniel Rich, a regular contributor to Criterion. And the cover art is by John Contino. With its fascinating flawed characters, evocative cinematography by the great Vilmos Sigmund, innovative overlapping dialogue and haunting use of Leonard Cohen's songs, McCabe and Mrs. Miller brilliantly deglamorized and revitalized the most American of genres. McCabe and Mrs. Miller has a running time of 121 minutes and it comes in a 240 by 1 aspect ratio and it releases on Tuesday the 6th of February as a 4K UHD Blu-ray combo with existing spine of 827. And coming in the next edition, we will be looking at the Eric Romer set of four films that's Tales of the Four Seasons. Spring, summer, autumn and winter. And that comes to the collection on Blu-ray. So until next time from me, it's goodbye. And above all, good Criterion viewing. <laughs> <laughs>